All right. So you you learned about Tanya. We we were studying in great depth the concept of three things. And if we'll keep these three things in mind, we'll never come to a sin. And then we were elaborating on this concept because it's a very far reaching concept. The Tanya, you under, I understand you, you learned the first two pages of the Tanya. The Tanya is about life. Hasinus itself is life. What is Hasinus? This is life. And since it's about life, it's not surprising that it should begin, the very beginning of the Tanya is about the beginning of life. Right? But before a person is born, I'm not sure if this means 40 days before a child is born, actually comes into this physical world, or if it, it's actually from conception, but the child, the, the, the neshama of the child is at, taken to the high court, the heavenly high court, and, an, and it, an oath is administered. And they ask every single one of you, are you sure you wanna go, you wanna leave this place? Are you sure you wanna go into the oil mahaze? It's not gonna be so nice down there like it is up here. It's like a gray day, you know, up, up, up above this, you take a plate up above the clouds, it's beautiful. And, and they asked all the, 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 the messengers went to the great repository of neshamas where all the neshamas are kept before they're born. And they said, who wants to go down to Oilam Hazen? Malka raised her hand. She was the first one. Yeah. And she waved it. I want to go. I want to. I said, why? Trying to do a mitzvah. Why? I want to light a Shabbos candle, she said. But you could stay here. You have Shabbos here. I said, but I don't have any candles here. There's no candles in Gan Eden. And is Bart Nora in Gan What? Is Bart Nora in Gan Eden? Oh. Bart Nora? Yeah. No, no. Oh, no. obviously. Yeah, come to the physical world. <clears throat> So they said, okay, but if you wanna go down, you have to not just promise, but give a solemn oath. And this oath was administered to every single person, every one of us, otherwise, otherwise you don't get to go. What is that? It's a twofold oath. Number one, they said to you, Devora. Do you swear that you're going to be a good girl? You said, yes. I said, okay, that's good. But it's only halfway. You have to swear that you're not going to do anything bad. And you said, I swear. I said, okay, you can go. And then two big strong angels came and began to take you down to this world. And all of a sudden it started to get very scary. And you weren't so sure, but now it was too late. And it was really scary. So by the time you got here, you were terrified. And when you came out, you were screaming. I'm not going to imitate the scream. <laughs> Sometimes I do. <laughs> Primal scream. I'm a newborn child when it looks around and realizes it's no longer in Gan Eden. Okay. <laughs> so that's how the Tanya begins with the very beginning of life. And the Alt Rebbe then asks two very serious questions. Number one,
But you have to, it says in the Mishnah, so you have to understand what is a Mishnah. I'm not sure if Rabbi Duba explained this to you or not, but it's very important to know it's a fundamental basis of our knowledge is that when the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, there was a complete body of knowledge given together with it to fill in. Everything is there, it's hinted in the words, but it's not explicit. When you have to know it, you, when you learn it, it's, it becomes very obvious. And this is a whole body of explanation that comes along together with the Torah. And this explanation was transmitted from by all the teachers of the Torah from Mount Sinai on because the Torah needed to be taught and needed to, to be explained. And it had its very, very exact and precise foundation, which we call the written Torah. Now that there's a huge body of explanation of what the written Torah means. And that's called the oral Torah. And you have to understand it's, it's fundamental that the oral Torah is from Mount Sinai, exactly the same as the written Torah. And there have throughout the centuries, the forces that struggled against holiness and godliness attacked, have attacked the authority of the oral Torah. So why should we believe in this? So we have to know <coughs> that if we don't believe in the oral Torah, we don't believe in anything. The oral Torah is the Torah and it was never allowed for anybody to write it down. Only it was like a, a secret treasure of the Jewish people. And so it went for about 1800 years. After 1800 years or so, approximately, which is about two, how many, uh, 1300 years, 13, 1300 years approximately. It's a long time. the Roman armies conquered Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed, except for part of it, the Western Wall. The Jewish people were murdered in huge numbers and cast into exile so that the transmission of the oral Torah could no longer be continued with the same thoroughness as formerly. And therefore, a great leader of the Jewish people at that time named Rabbi Yehuda, the prince, he was the leader of the Jewish people. He was a direct descendant of King David. And he took upon himself with permission of heaven to do something absolutely revolutionary. He wrote down the oral Torah because he understood that under these conditions of persecution and hardship, the oral Torah will not survive if we don't write it down. And so he, there were different versions the way it was transmitted varied from teacher to teacher because of the um, because of the inclinations, the natural inclinations in the soul of each teacher. Like one teacher would be more strict, one teacher would be more lenient, <laughs> one teacher would be concentrating on details, one teacher would be elaborating more. So there were different versions, explanations. Yes, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you.
And the Rebbe Yehuda reviewed all of them. And, and uh, he set them down and they are called Mishnah. The word Mishnah is like the Hebrew word Shnayim, yeah? In, in Hebrew, we have the word for one is echad, and the word for two is shnayim, right? So that's the root of the word mishnah. Right? You see it there, mishnah. And what it refers to is on one level, Uh, well, Joseph in Egypt, he was viceroy to Pharaoh. That means he was Mishnah Lamelech, who's second to the king. So Mishnah, the oral Torah, is Mishnah is, is like a queen compared to the written Torah, which is the king. And a king without a queen is not a king. A king has to have a queen. Without a queen, he's not a king, and he's not great. The word Mishnah also means, since the second that, that is something we learn by repetition. Mishnah means to repeat, to repeat over and over and over again. And that's how they learned Mishnah, by repeating it. So that it's the, the Mishnah is actually has a built-in design to it that it's it's designed in order to enable memorization. And it comes in short chunks. Since Jewish life is very complex, not simple at all. It's a lot more to Jewish life than keeping kosher, and having mezuzahs on your door. It's very complex. And to learn the Mishnah is a, is a, a lifetime's work. It encompasses the whole of life. I would call, by way of a nickname, the Mishnah is like knowledge nuggets. Little mnemonic paragraphs loaded with information, chock a block with information, so that every single word, even every letter, is teaching you something else about the subject. And what is the subject? The subject is the oral law, is the written law. I'll give you an example. On every doorpost, we have a mezuzah. Why? You say the Shema. Everybody knows Shema, right? These words which I command you today should be upon your heart. You should speak about them when you're sitting at home, when you go out somewhere. When you lie down at night, you should say the Shema. When you get up in the morning, you should say the Shema. And you should tie them for a sign upon your arm. And you should put them for tefillin over your eyes. And you should write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's the mezuzah. That's all the Torah tells you. Now you say, how do I get a mezuzah? We well, go to the store. How does the store get a mezuzah? What is a mezuzah? Torah doesn't say anywhere. You can learn the whole Torah. Won't tell you what a mezuzah is. Or what tefillin are. Or what words are you supposed to say? Or how do you write a Torah? What are the letters? How is each letter made? All those details. What, what words go into a mezuzah? Shema. How do you know? It's oral Torah. 
What should it be written on? I once examined the mezuzah on the doorpost. It was a photocopy of the Ten Commandments. The person bought it in Walgreens, some store like that. <laughs> what 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 goes in a mezuzah? Unfortunately, a lot of people think a mezuzah is just a mezuzah case. Okay, let's say you have a mezuzah. You have a parchment. Parchment is made from what? From the skin of a kosher animal. And it's written with ink. Ink is made in a certain form with a certain formula of gall nuts and so on. It should be black and not red. And on so many lines, the lines have to be drawn, they have the lines have to be scri inscribed into the parchment, and each letter and each word goes in exactly in its place, in its line. Some letters are big and some letters are small, and then on tops of the letters there are swords. On the tops of the letters, if you have a mezuzah without these swords on it, it's like having a car with no gas. Lovely car sitting in front of your house. Let's go for a drive. Well, it doesn't go. The function of the mezuzah is to protect the house. Like the function, it's not a reward. It's not a reward for having the mezuzah any more than it's a reward for a soldier to wear a helmet. It's not a reward if it, the helmet saves him from getting a bullet in the head. It's a function of the mezuzah. But in order to function, it has to be a real mezuzah. Where does the mezuzah go? Do I write, it says you should write these words on the doorposts of your house. Do I write them with a pen? <clears throat> if I write them on, this, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on a parchment, in the right way, each letter properly done, where do I put it? Do I put it on both sides? No, I put it on the right side. What's the right side of a doorpost? Which side is the right side of the doorpost? These are questions that are all answered in the oral law. The answer, by the way, is it depends on the way the door opens. The way the door opens, that tells you which is the right. As you go in, that's the right side. Now, where do I have to put it? If you put it too high, it doesn't do the job. If you put it too low, it doesn't do the job. It has to be like eye level. So the Torah says eye level is, if you divide the doorpost into three, you take the upper section, the lower half, the, lo the, the lower part, the upper section, tilt it in, because that's the direction that you're going in. What happens if my house goes I enter the house, I come into the living room, come into the dining room, come into a hallway, come into the kitchen. Where do I put the, the mezuzah going into the kitchen? Which side? Which side? No, there's no any mini mini mo. No, that, that's not gonna, not, no, no, there's no guesswork here. The answer is, are you, the question is, are you going into the kitchen? Are you coming out of the kitchen? And the answer is, what's the main room where you learn Torah? You're going into the main room. So if you're going from the kitchen into the dining room and you're gonna have a shear in the dining room, so you're going into the dining room, the mezuzah is gonna be on the right side, going into the dining room from the kitchen. These are the subjects, the details that are considered in the oral law. That's just one example. Without the oral law, you can't keep can't keep Judaism. Okay, so now we learn in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the foundation stone. The Mishnahs are the, the stones with which the oral law is built. So comes along a Mishnah and says that when they administered this oath to the child, they told the child, "You should be righteous." And you should, it's so urgent that you should be righteous that don't ever start taking your life for granted and think, oh yeah, I'm okay. Even if the whole world tells you that you're, you are Shoshana, 
that you are at Sadekis. You came all the way from Syracuse to learn Torah. Don't get complacent. Don't get complacent. <laughs> In your own eyes, you should be like wanting. You should be like wicked in your own eyes. And right away, the Alter Rebbe says, how can you say such a thing? How dare you say such a thing to a nice Jewish girl that she should think that she's a wicked person? You know what's going to happen if you tell someone that they're wicked? They're going to think they're wicked. And when you think you're wicked, you know what you do? You do wicked things. How many times you hear from the psychologists, why did this child end up in trouble? My mother always told me I'd end up in jail. My teachers told me I was no good. So what do they expect from me? I, I know I'm no good. I've always been no good. So it's a, it's, a, it's a serious objection. How does the Mishnah dare say you should be wicked in your own eyes? And not, well, we can't criticize the Mishnah. We can't, because the Mishnah is Torah. It's as, it's as, as strong as written Torah. Without the, without the Mishnah, I don't know what the, or what the written Torah means anyway. So how does the Torah tell me that? And I'll make the question even stronger, says the Alter Emma. The basis of all wisdom in Judaism is called the ethics of the fathers. Pure We read it before from Pesach until Rosh Hashanah. Every week we read it, we study it. Because this is the basis of all wisdom. It's called fathers because it's the, fa the father of all wisdom. To teach, it's, it, it's, I don't know. It's called the, the, the fathers because it's transmitted through the sages. But it's also called the teachings of the fathers because it's the fathers of all wisdom. And that's, that's really a universal truth. So one of the things that it says there is something that psychologists are just now discovering. But the Torah tell, told it to us all along. As it was written down when, when we say 2,000 years ago, called from the teachings of the sages, a person should never be wicked in his or her own eyes. Because if you think that you're wicked, you're going to be depressed. You're going to be upset with yourself. And you won't be able to serve Hashem with a happiness and a full heart. What does every father and mother want for their children? They want them to be happy. Hashem is no different. He wants his children to be happy. It's not. When Hashem sees that we are happy, he sends blessings into the world. When we share our simcha together, it brings blessings to the family and to everybody involved. When Hashem sees people fighting, how does a parent feel when he sees his children fighting? Oh, it's, it's the worst pain. What do I have, what do I have children for? That they should fight with each other, hurt each other, despise one another. It's the whole point of creation. Is undermined. So don't tell a person that they're no good because it's not going to lead to any good. Tracht good, sign good, think good. But a person helps them to be good. Now we got a problem. These two Mishnas are at loggerheads. One says, even if the whole world tells you how good you are, in your own eyes you should be bad. The other one says you should never think that you're bad because then you're going to be bad. How do I resolve this? And they are both oral Torah Mishnah, top of the line, authoritative. Now, the Mishnah is very, very precise. And after 100 years, 200 years after the destruction of the temple, 
the teachers of the, that time and their communities no longer understood everything what the Mishnah was getting at. So we have a whole new body of literature growing up explaining the Mishnah. The Mishnah explains the written Torah, but the Mishnah itself needs explanations. <coughs> and a few hundred years later down the line after that, we need further explanations of the commentators because what's obvious to them is no longer obvious to the average person who needs to know what should he do in such and such a case or some other case or some variation. And so we get an, a, a, an organic growing body of explanation and knowledge, which, be, which is called Talmud. and teachers of Talmud, and yeshivas teaching Talmud. But the rock bottom foundation of the Talmud is Mishnah. And Mishnah and, and Torah are like king and queen. They're one thing. <laughs> Got it? So to answer this question, the Alt Rebbe writes the Tanya. You're not gonna get the answer to this question so quickly. Did Rabbi Dubov learn with you the first page of the Tanya? The story about the person who wanted to go to Yerushalayim? The long, short way? Mm -hmm. You learned that? Yeah. Okay, so Tanya is a long, short way. It's not, you're not going to get to the answer by turning the page to find out if the bot, I mean, almost said if the bot would do it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the, the, the two questions, how you read that the, you should be read, you should not be read, they are different Mishnah. Yes. One Mishnah yes. complete saying that, and another Mishnah saying the other. Yes. Okay, thank you. And two different Mishnah. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. So to understand this question, we had to understand that things are not exactly so simple. And the Alter Rebbe explained to us five categories that we, we will start off learning about three things. Remember three things, oneself and God and the world. Another variation on that is three things, is three levels of Jewish people just like there are Kohanim, Levim, and Yisraelim, so too the, the, the congregation of the Jewish people, a congregation is called a tzibur, congregation. The Hebrew word is tzibur. The tzaddik stands for a righteous person. Tzaddik. The reish stands for a wicked person. And the base stands for the benoni. Wicked people, righteous people, Benani, what are Benani? We're going to have to find out what the Benani really is. But we need all of them to make a congregation. We can't have a congregation just of tzaddikim. We can't have a Chabad house that only admits righteous people. And we can't have a Chabad house that admits only wicked people. We have to have all kinds of people because we that's the Jewish people. And we have to, we have to, find and discover and reveal the unity between all of us because that's what makes a congregation okay now you think you have three says the out but no it's really three which is five because
we have tzaddikim who are who have who have good and we have tzaddikim who don't have good or complete tzaddikim let's put it this way we have tzaddikim who are complete tzaddikim and who are incomplete that means they're righteous people but they could be even more righteous and similarly in the world of the way in the realm the world of the wicked we have the not so wicked Who are wicked, but not so wicked. I once read a book about the Jewish mafia. At the turn of the century, when the immigrants came to America and they were struggling to earn a living, so there were tough guys. There were certain tough guys who sort of took control in the streets. And they were into a lot of the illegal things. Uh, And many of them were very, very smart. And, and many of them were very tough. So I read a book once about them. The title of the book was, but he was, it was about criminals, Jewish criminals. He says, but, but he was very good to his mother. <laughs> He's not so wicked. He has his good point. And every Jewish person has his good. In fact, the Talmud says that every single Jew is so full of good things, no matter how bad he might be. Even a sinner of the Jewish people is full of goodness, like a pomegranate is full of seeds. So our job when we meet somebody and your first thing the inclination is, oh boy, I gotta be careful of this guy. No, don't be, don't look out for how he's gonna hurt you. Look for how good he is. When you look for the good in a person, you, you find it. Okay, but then we actually do have the totally, the completely wicked person. So we've got five categories now. <coughs> and we're gonna have to find out what all these categories stand for. I don't know if anybody in history ever fell into this category of totally wicked. Because the Mishnah says that every single Jew, even a sinner, is full of good deeds. So who is this totally wicked person, Morgan? But you have to have a definition. You have to have parameters. So that's, that's the bottom. The person who's totally, totally wicked. We'll find out about that chapter 11. As for the good person, the completely good person, do you know anybody who's completely good? Absolutely, completely, totally, 100%, not 99 and 44, 100 percent, and it floats. A totally good person is going to be totally a master of himself. Mass, all his actions are going to be perfectly good. All his words are going to be perfectly good. All his thoughts are going to be perfectly good. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It says in the, in the Zohar, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochoi, I saw... I looked into the repository of souls. He says in the name of God. Looked into the repository of souls to see those which were totally good. You learned this. This is, this is the last things that you learned. And there were very, very few. There were very, very few such holy, holy neshamas. So therefore, the sages tell us in the name of the Almighty God, 
I took one and made sure that there was one in every generation. So you have a Noyach. We learned about Noyach last week. It says Noyach was a tzaddik in his generation. He saved the whole world. <laughs> he did a great thing. Who else is called a tzaddik in the Torah? Joseph. Yosef is the first person of the Jewish people who's called a tzaddik. And he was greater than Noyach. A, a, a person told me once a humorous comment, why, was, why is Yosef greater than, than Noyach? Noyach kept the whole world alive for a whole year. He fed everybody for a whole year in the ark. Yosef fed the whole world for two years. Literally, nobody lifted a hand or foot without his say-so. And Yosef, Noyach, drank wine and messed up. He messed up. Yosef was put to the test by Potiphar's wife. He spent 13 years in prison because of it. But he passed the test. And therefore, he's called a tzaddik, the tzaddik. So, Yosef is a tzaddik in his time. Moshe Rabbeinu is the tzaddik of all time. That is the complete tzaddik, is Moshe Rabbeinu. And since the Torah is eternal, so there must be that we have Rashayim and Bainanim and Sadiqim in every generation. <clears throat> totally wicked, I don't think ever exists. But people who are Sadiqim, who could be more Sadiqim, do exist. And totally complete Sadiqim, maybe one maybe two, but at least one. When I say maybe two, maybe there were people who could have been the moisture of of their generation. And for certain reasons, they weren't moisture of but they were, they could have been. So they, maybe they're also complete Sadiqim, but at least there's one, okay? That's where you learned up to when I was gone. Quick summary. Any questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Two things. Three things. Three reminders. Number one, on the way to class, be sure to look up and see what's going on above us. That's why we're created on two feet and not four. Animals on four feet are always looking down. We're created on two feet, we can look up. Number two, please come on time. And if you're late, don't be afraid to walk in late. When you come late, it means that that's what you were meant to hear. What you didn't hear, you weren't meant to hear. So please, don't be shy, but come in even if you're late. <coughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Bezras Hashem, 8.30.